There's a very wonderful animated version of the book done between, I think, 1960 and 1965. And uh, the Jade Emperor, so the, the baddie, the guy who's trying to keep Monkey down and who Monkey rebels against, has a very noticeable mole on his chin, um, <laughs> as did Mao. And in ni after 1965 and the Cultural Revolution, the this wonderful, beautifully done animation uh, was censored and it wasn't possible to to watch it again until the uh, until the 1970s and the rumor went that um the, the jade emperor with his mole had actually been a dig at mao and the reason one of the important reasons why it had been censored is because of this not so veiled criticism of uh, the guy at the top journey to the west has an amazing new translation and none other than julian lovell translated it Yes, that's the same Julia Lovell of Maoism, A Global History, a book so good that it earned a two-part treatment last year on China Talk. Co-hosting with us is Brendan O'Kane, himself a translator of classical Chinese. One quick announcement, I'll be in the Bay Area October 5th through the 10th or so. It would be great to meet up with some folks there, either one-on-one -on -one or in a sort of China Talk meetup session. I'm hoping to do both. Please get in touch with me either on Twitter or I'll leave my personal email in the show notes. Thanks. Julia, what is the Monkey King? Monkey King, uh, also often known by the literal translation of its Chinese title, Journey to the West, Qi or Ji in Chinese, is one of the masterworks of pre-20th century Chinese fiction. And so it's one of its one of its qi shu. We can't be sure exactly who wrote it because it was first published in China in 1592 anonymously. But some literary critics have identified a talented writer of poetry and ghost stories, a man from Southeast China called Wu Chang'en, as its author. What is more certain is that the novel's hero is uh, Sun Wukong, a magic monkey king with superpowers like travelling 108,000 miles in a single leap, or he can, tr he can turn himself into pretty much anything he likes. And he's also unbeatable at Kung Fu. But he's mischievous, arrogant, and totally lacking in self-control, and quickly gets into a huge fight with the Jade Emperor, ruler of the Taoist Heaven, by guzzling all the immortal peaches, wines, and elixirs reserved for a massive heavenly banquet. So this brings down upon him the fury of heaven. Uh, the Jade Emperor declares war on Monkey, and eventually, after several huge battles, the Jade Emperor has to call the Buddha in from India and the Buddha punishes Monkey by imprisoning him under a mountain for 500 years. After which he's finally released to protect a Chinese monk, Tripitaka, on a dangerous pilgrimage to India to collect Buddhist scriptures. And three other fallen immortals are also chosen to go with Tripitaka again to redeem their sins. So there's Pigsy, a pig demon, Chubajia, uh, in Chinese. There's Sandy Shasung, a river sand monster, and a little dragon who turns himself into a horse to carry Tripitaka to India. Monkey, Tripitaka, Pigsy, Sandy, and the dragon horse have to overcome multiple monsters, rivers, and mountains. They eventually reach India, deliver the sutras back to China, then become immortals in the Buddha's monastery. So the book's about many things. It's about religion, it's about faith, it's about spiritual journeys, it's also extremely funny and playful. Uh, but amongst these many other things, the novel also has this kind of character arc, this moral arc of redemption, so it traces Monkey's journey from troublemaker to virtuous Buddhist. How has this book been translated in the past? There are various translations, both full translations and abridgments into English that already existed. Not surprisingly, it's such a canonical novel within the Chinese literary tradition. Um, and I have enormous respect for these existing translations. So one, some of the most famous ones would be Arthur Whaley's Abridgment, Monkey, uh, published in the 1940s, the professor of comparative literature at Chicago, uh, Anthony Yu, put together both a four volume full translation between the 1970s and 1980s, and also an abridged version called The Monkey and the Monk. And the British sinologist uh, William Jenner did his own full translation uh, between the 1980s and 1990s. And, and all these uh, different takes on the book are extraordinary literary and scholarly resources. My own history with this book was I was actually 
invited to take it on by uh, a wonderful editor of Penguin Classics, John Siciliano. So it wasn't originally my idea. And it's not a project that I would have perhaps thought of naturally for myself. My training is very much in modern Chinese and all my translations up to this point have been of 20th and 21st century authors. But as soon as I started to think seriously about it, it made really good intellectual sense as a way of developing my uh, knowledge about Chinese literature. So first it was a great chance to take a deep dive into the language and structures of pre-modern vernacular fiction, which is such an important influence on many of the contemporary novelists. So the full translations that exist are exceptional resources, but um, the length and the vast amount of intricate detail the novel contains can, I think, seem intimidating to readers. And Arthur Whaley's Abridgment Monkey was completed some 80 years ago, since when language and literary style have changed a lot. So the challenge I gave myself in taking this job on was can I study the original, the Chinese original in full? Can I assess and select what I feel are the most important elements and then translate them in a contemporary idiom that both reflects the profound otherness of the world being described? Because, of course, the world of, of Monkey King uh, is that of a magic Chinese monkey and um, it, it's full of imperial China's attitudes to religion and the supernatural. So can I find an idiom that both reflects this fundamental strangeness of the novel, but also that communicates its energy and appeal across the centuries to Anglophone readers today? I spent a long time thinking about the different elements in the book and also, I should say, thinking about my predecessors, so thinking about uh, translation history. And in the... The, the the writing of the translation history of Journey to the West, you could say that there's there's one fairly sort of large debate, which is broadly speaking between Arthur Whaley's version um, and his his approach and uh, Anthony Yu's approach. So um, to sort of summarise um, a great deal, Arthur Whaley's approach could be seen um, as emphasising the the the, the fun and the froth and the folksiness of the story um, and in so doing perhaps he um, somewhat effaces or marginalises the sort of enormous religious and ritual complexity of the book. Um, Anthony Yu appreciated the, the speed at which Whaley's translation moved uh, but he felt that the extremely technical and profound and often abstruse religious elements had uh, sometimes been effaced too much and so he felt really inspired to, was sort of really driven to bring those back in in his extremely particular, extremely erudite full translation. Um, I hope that I could bring elements of both those readings out in the translation because I really did spend a lot of time reading the, 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 the original and reading scholarship about it. And the conclusion I came to is that uh, it is an open text. It's one that lends itself to multiple explanations and also constant adaptations and re-adaptations, among which, in a way, I see my translation as just the latest of many reworkings of uh, Journey to the West. So in the 20th century, Chinese critics and writers often underplayed the religious elements. They read it as a fun, playful piece of fiction. But of course, religion is everywhere in the novel. There's the Buddhist pilgrimage driving the central quest. There's this moral arc of redemption for monkey. Um, the book's also full of references to Taoism, the Jade Emperor and his pantheon of deities, uh, hell, and, and monkey superpowers, of course, come from Taoist techniques of self-cultivation. In fact, in the century since it was written, the novel has often been used in China as a guide to Taoist practices and beliefs. And the novel is also full of Confucian filial piety, so there's this recurring joke in which monsters fail to eat Tripitaka before Monkey rescues him. Um, so they kidnap Tripitaka because they think eating his flesh will make him will, will make them immortal. But they don't get round to eating him fast enough because they always want to invite their parents to the feast like the good Confucian children that they are. Um, <laughs> but I would say that the book, so it has all these different religious elements. Um, it's also hugely fun and 
fantastical and playful and is therefore too open to support a single interpretation and all I could do was try to decide what were the main themes and decide to translate the parts of the book which brought out those main themes. So another really important part of the book, it is deeply irreverent towards religious and moral authority with much mockery of religion and its and its institutions. At one point, Monkey, the mischief maker, even urinates on the hand of the Buddha. So the book stands out for its subversiveness as well as its spirituality. So I, as I, as I read the book, as I read scholarship about the book, I made a list of what I felt were the key themes. I'm not sure that I um, prioritise one theme overall uh, above others. I just tried to bring out this, these multivocal elements as much as I could. Yeah, very successfully, I think. And your translation is just fun to read in a way that Anthony Yu's version, like, I mean, I can appreciate it as a work of scholarship, but I wouldn't exactly recommend it as beach reading. And Whaley's version is still probably the standard in English, but as you say, it's a little dated in its English usage. And Whaley didn't really know Chinese as a spoken language, so there are all of these puns and colloquialisms that he misses. And um, sort of on the same subject, it occurred to me last night that the story of Journey to the West, or at least the story of the historical Xuanzang, the historical Tripitaka, is actually about the quest to find a better translation. That's why he's going to India to get the sutras in the first place. Well, yes, it, it, exactly. Um, so although the book is so fantastical, uh, it is, of course... A historical novel in its way. It's based on a real, remarkable historical individual in history, this Tang monk of the 7th century, uh, Tripitaka, who, he, who took holy orders at a young age, um, but very soon felt impatient with errors and omissions in the translations of Buddhist scriptures that had so far reached China. So he took it upon himself in the uh, late 620s to travel to India himself and bring back these original Buddhist texts uh, to translate into Chinese and sort of undertook this incredibly difficult journey uh, without, I should point out, actually the help of a magical monkey disciple. I, th I think the, the book tells us very interesting things about China's interactions with the world beyond its borders and i'd be really interested to know what how you two read this element of the book so so on the one hand it's about a journey out of china it's about fascination with foreign places with a foreign religion buddhism and it sometimes speaks admiringly of the prosperity and beauty of the non-chinese cities that the pilgrims encounter but there's also a slightly strange aspect to these foreign travels. So on the other hand, however far they travel, the landscape never seems to change that much for the pilgrims or it repeats itself. Another strange thing is that the pilgrims from China don't seem to struggle with learning foreign languages. Um, so everybody seems to speak Chinese um, and uh, the Taoist Chinese religious hierarchy still hold sway, you know, pretty much all the way to India. And then right at the end, when the pilgrims return briefly to China for a banquet with the Tang Emperor, uh, they reflect on, quote, how great China was and how mediocre the lands of the West were by comparison. So, uh, and, and end of that quote. So one thing which I uh, thought about as I was working on the translation was whether the book projects cosmopolitanism or maybe provincialism you know does it project the idea that the rest of the world is going to be just like China or maybe a little bit less good than China um, and if the book is projecting this provincialism is this done ironically or sincerely um, I mean another really interesting aspect of this that the great um, Oxford sinologist Craig Clunas pointed out to me recently is you know not only does the do the languages and the religions not change on the way out of China uh, to India but the food doesn't change either you know there's always fried noodles to tempt pixie with um, or steamed buns and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the story is set in the Tang Dynasty, but our text is from the 16th century. And 
One of the things I really enjoy about hanging out in the late Ming is that people are writing and reading at a time when China is the richest country in the world that they know of. They don't have the anxieties and the sense of inferiority in the face of foreign imperialism and foreign hostility and foreign technological advancement that you find from the 19th century onward. And that passage about the feast at the end of the book jumped out at me as well. And, and uh, I think also before that, there's a mention in the episode about the kingdom of women where uh, Tripitaka is from China and therefore he's wealthy and cultured enough to be a fitting husband. Yeah, I, th I think everything you say there is completely valid and I think it's it's really worthwhile looking in the novel for the imprint of the era in which it was written. I think that it can tell us so much about the intellectual, cultural, um, social, political, philosophical um, and as you suggest also kind of military foreign policy history of um, the era of kind of the, the high Ming, if you like, um, uh, or a little bit after the high Ming, maybe. The emperorship is, is starting to turn in on itself. It's starting to seem increasingly dysfunctional. Um, but the empire of Ming China is enormously wealthy. It's the centre of a global luxuries trade. It's seen this extraordinary expansion of population and literacy and sort of publishing education and culture um, uh, and connoisseurship and, and, and consumerism which is all enormously vibrant. I think there are some slightly more sort of negative strains being reflected in the book um, also. Um, so I think one uh, thing that the book does is I think it does satirise the idea of absolutist rulership. Um, you know, remember that uh, so many of, you know, the, uh, of the authors, the author himself wanted to be, it pro probably would have wanted to be an official if he didn't manage it himself, but he would also have seen the fate of many other educated men uh, serving increasingly eccentric, unpredictable, sort of absolutist uh, tyrants on the emperor's uh, throne between the 15th and uh, 16th centuries. So, Julia, speaking of unstable tyrants, you did, of course, just write a book about Mao. Um, what are the parallels and how did he like the book? Mao also loved the novel and that became a really interesting thread joining the um, Global Mail project with this. I actually ended up taking them on at the same time and it was really interesting to see these links develop. Um, so the, the, the centrepiece story of uh, the history of Global Maoism is, is really the it's the early 60s through to the mid 60s, the um, uh, eruption of the cultural revolution so this is this is the the campaign the the, the vehicle uh through which many of mao's ideas are vectored globally um and i was struck by learning that that mao actually was reading journey to the west on the eve of launching the cultural revolution i think sort of april may um and the connection here is that you know mao um, as is well known, was an anarchist in his early 20s. Um, although he was a profoundly uh, autocratic man, he was very uh, dedicated to building his own personality cult. On the other hand, throughout his life, he always saw himself as a kind of rebel or an outlier. And monkeys, Sun Wukong's uh, havoc wreaking, troublemaking, were a lifelong inspiration to Mao. So in 1966, as I say, at the start of the Cultural Revolution, Mao was rereading the novel and he invoked Monkey as a model rebel to incite student Red Guards to attack the Communist Party establishment. But, but, but this sort of focus on Monkey's rebellion had really begun 10 or so years earlier in the 1950s. So in a, in a climate in which 
any um, cultural artefact written in the quote unquote old society, you know, before 1949, was vulnerable to attack and criticism. It's striking that uh, Xi Ji journey to the West, it's, it's not attacked in the same way. Uh, the edition that I translated from is the, a 1954 edition, uh, edited and put together by uh, the, the writer's uh, publishing house, the Tojia Chuban Shur. So there's obviously some message from up high saying that this is a, you know, a healthy cultural product that can be uh, publicized in the People's Republic of China. Um, but it's at this point that the, the novel is very much um, uh, chopped and changed to fit a message that suits Mao's own manifesto of rebellion and revolution. So in the original, of course, so Monkey gets into this terrible trouble with heaven um, and is punished and has to redeem himself. So it's the first seven or so chapters is Monkey's rebellion and the rest of the remaining 93 chapters is Monkey having to make good on these terrible things that he's done. But the 19, sort of 1950s adaptations on sort of stage and um, uh, opera and then film and cartoon, uh, they effectively ended the novel at the end of chapter seven. So at the end of Monkey's Rebellion Against Heaven, so his Dan Ao Tian Gong, and they completely changed the ending of that. So rather than Monkey being uh, chastised and uh, pinned under a mountain by the Buddha, uh, Monkey, uh, the story was changed so that Monkey was victorious. Uh, Monkey sort of brought down stuffy, old, oppressive heaven. So in the context of the 1950s, Mao's revolution, Mao's sort of peasant-backed uh, revolution just having triumphed in 1949, it's very easy to see how this changing of the uh, sort of reshaping uh, of Journey to the West would fit with Mao's own sort of vision, political vision uh, of the masses overturning the, the elites and the establishment. Um, and Mao absolutely identified himself, I think, with Sun Wukong. Although an extra interesting footnote is that there's a very wonderful, still very wonderful uh, animated version of the book done between, I think, 1960 and 1965 uh, in two parts. And uh, the Jade Emperor, so the, the baddie, the guy who's trying to keep Monkey down and who Monkey rebels against, has a very, very noticeable mole on his chin, um, <laughs> as did Mao. And in night after 1965 in the Cultural <laughs> Revolution, the this wonderful, beautifully done animation uh, was censored, and it wasn't possible to to watch it again until the uh, until the 1970s. And the rumor went that um, the, the Jade Emperor with his mole had actually been a dig at Mao. And the reason, one of the important reasons why it had been censored um, is because of this not so veiled criticism of uh, the guy at the top. I'm so glad you mentioned the animated version of The Rumpus in Heaven. I, I want to second that recommendation. You can find it on YouTube. It's gorgeous. And I think that was actually my first exposure as a kid to Journey to the West, a series of picture books that I got in Philadelphia's Chinatown uh, with artwork that was either taken from the Shanghai Animation Studio cells or uh, was strongly influenced by it. That, I, that's another um, of the really appealing aspects and, and remarkable aspects of the book, I think. It's its ability to survive over the centuries in... Uh, through adaptations and reworking. So it's a novel which is about shape-shifting, which has um, itself shape-shifted. Um, and uh, Journey to the West was actually, to my knowledge, my first contact with East Asian culture. So I grew up in remote parts of provincial England in the 1980s. These were times and places where China felt so distant from ordinary life, it almost seemed to exist on another planet. But on Saturday mornings, I would sit in front of the TV, mesmerized by a show called Monkey. And it was only years later that I realized this was a Japanese adaptation from the 1970s of Journey to the West. Now, the, the production values were low, the dubbing was clumsy, but 
there was something about the the characters and the situations that were so hilariously eccentric that the show became a cult cultural phenomenon for me and many of my generation in the UK. So when I actually read the novel um, as a university student of Chinese, I, of course, at that point, I began to appreciate the richness of the book, you know, its, its religious elements, you know, everything it tells us about Chinese society and, and culture. But at the same time, the aspects that had still appealed to, um, to me as a child, they, they still held so the extraordinary fantasy sequences, the uh, irreverence of monkey, you know, the out there monsters and, and demons. So while I was working on my own translation, I rediscovered the, the TV show with my teenage son. And I was struck by how he too was immediately entranced and entertained by it, even to the point that on social media, he actually uses the face of the monkey character as his avatar. And he includes as his tagline the uh, opening credits succinct summary of monkey Sun Wukong, uh, which goes, the nature of monkey was irrepressible. So what scene did you most enjoy translating? Well, I think that I am uh, uh, one of the first women to translate the book into English. And I was very keen to bring out strong female characters or uh, female related stories within the book, uh, of which there are many. So at one point, the male pilgrims pass into the uh, country of women. And there are no men in this land and women have to become pregnant by drinking from a magic river. Now the pilgrims don't know this, so when Tripitaka and Jubadia Pixie get thirsty, they have a drink and almost immediately go into labour. And Tripitaka and Pigsy immediately become quivering wrecks of fear at the prospect of childbirth. Um, even though they face so many terrifying demons already, it seems that nothing compares to the, 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 the hell of labour. Um, so, although the writer was most likely male, I was struck by this empathetic appreciation of the trials of childbirth, and as someone who's gone into labour three times myself, I, I couldn't help but um, appreciate that perspective. And then after Monkey gets them out of that tight spot by getting them some more magic water as, a, as an antidote, the pilgrims still have to go through the land of women, they experience some very uncomfortable gender power reversal, so they're gaped at by women, they're um, forced into marriage, they have to experience a world where the other sex is so much more powerful than them. And I, I found this imagination of a world of sexual power turned upside down really fascinatingly subversive for a 16th century novel and, and probably actually my favourite fight scene also involves a uh, female demon, the very famous Tiashan Gongzhu, uh, Princess Iron Fan. Um, and uh, she has a magic um, uh, fire extinguishing fan that uh, Monkey needs in order to continue on their journey. Um, but she has a major grudge against Monkey. Uh, and so uh, far from giving him the fan, um, instead she challenges him to a duel. Now Monkey is uh, unable to best her in a fight. So Monkey turns himself into a tiny fly, um, conceals himself inside one of the bubbles on the top of Princess Iron Fan's tea. She's thirsty after the battle with Monkey gulps it down and so now monkey is in her stomach and then he quickly turns himself back into a monkey and starts doing kung fu inside her which is of course very painful um so very quickly uh she has no choice but to uh, promise to give him the fan um uh after which um monkey finally emerges uh grabs it and takes it off but princess iron fan is not done with him yet because she's very cleverly given him a fake fan, uh, which in fact, far from extinguishing fire, actually makes fire burn even more intensely. Um, so in terms of that particular encounter, I think that Princess Iron Fan definitely has the last laugh. One of my favorite things about your translation is all these lovely little turns of phrase where you manage to dodge the clunky translatees that 
tends to plague Chinese literature and translation. And you come up with felicitous descriptions, um, I think my favorite of which was the mention of a heavenly functionary's bouffant eyebrows. Um, this may seem like an obvious question to anybody but a translator, but how did you go about taking things that were funny in Chinese and making them funny in English? Oh, what, what a lovely thing to say. And I, I really must say that writing this translation was sheer fun. I mean, after six years with, with Global Mao, it was, it was extremely therapeutic to work on this book. I mean, I, I should point out when I was talking about the reception of the book, um, Mao loved the book, but it's also a book which has always been beloved of you know rebels and creatives as well as authoritarian. So it, it has this, this kind of absolute effervescent creativity and imagination within it. In terms of the uh, descriptions, uh, one element of the but one formal element of the book which I decided not to represent in my translation is that the original contains a huge amount of descriptive poetry. Um, and I only translated those poems when they contained some element which pushed the plot on. So most of the time, those poems function a little bit like arias in opera. So they are kind of deepening a description uh, or a particular expression. Uh, they might elaborate on the appearance uh, of a new monster, a new princess, a new king, uh, or on the process of a particular fight, but they don't necessarily, so they deepen that particular descriptive moment, but they don't necessarily, for the most part, they don't push the plot forwards. Um, however, because they are so sort of rich and inventive in their descriptive elements, although I did not translate the poems for the most part as poems, I did very, very often incorporate their descriptive language um, in uh, shortened forms, uh, in hopefully forms which I felt would be um, vivid and immediate and direct. So I incorporated those descriptions into the prose uh, that either came before the poem or after the poem. So you know, that's just a wonderful resource of the uh, 100 chapter original in Chinese that you just have this intensity and depth of description which is just a, a, an incredible thing for a translator um, to sometimes be quite magpie-like to sort of pull out turns of phrases or um, uh, styles of delivery that appeal to me and I thought might be useful. So Julia, what's next? Well, one of the real pleasures of, or one of the many pleasures of working on this translation is because it is such a profoundly religious, spiritual book, as well as being funny and playful. In order to um, make some headway in understanding the book, I needed to read really very deeply and widely in the history of Chinese religion, um, ritual, religious ritual, and so on and so forth. Um, so that reading is ongoing and it's uh, led me to greater engagement uh, with China's both, both written and uh, deeper past, including uh, archaeology, you know, what it can tell us about the, 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 the makeup of uh, early Chinese uh, society and culture. So at the moment I'm working towards a history of Chinese archaeology um, uh, both from the beginning of from the from the beginning of the 20th century through to the present day so it's history and practice of this discipline <laughs> Hello 
吹来，你为何泪流百年？剩沉默的烟火熏出伤口，解毒的只有一口。泛酸的鬼话叫人收工，那些苦衷没人能懂。原来英雄也愁痛，血白晶晶的笑容染红了夜空，化作心底入魔的彩虹。悟空，说伟大却不做野心家，这是谎话。丧尽的天下，巨大的真假，我睡醒走天下。我是七年大圣。下起点大声，大声，大声，大声。你们合唱下一秒的力量叫做天下无双。你们擦亮金箍棒，我的什么？